This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. Hey guys, it is the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this is the show where we talk with people in and around independent professional wrestling. And you can check out all the great podcasts over at WrestlingMayhemShow.com, including a lot of our discussions over... Uh, I don't even know what number I left off at. <laughs> I think it's over 200 interviews we have at least over there. Um, I just I just gave up on numbering. It's like you know what? There's just there's just a bunch of them. Just just go go look for your favorite person that may be in a Fed with three letters and are not, not right now. And we've talked to plenty of them. Um, and of course, uh, please go check out IndieWrestling.us. A lot of people we interview, including our guest tonight, is featured on several titles, sometimes under different names. So make sure you get them all. Um, or maybe we forget those old names. Depends on how this interview goes. Uh, <laughs> so, and, um, and of course, go check out www.IndieWrestling.network, uh, where you guys can uh, uh, fill up on all the great wrestling content from our friends from Premiere, Rise, uh, old PWO, Pro Wrestling Ohio stuff, with like old johnny gargano and stuff like that doesn't even look the same he has flag tights it's weird uh <laughs> djz has a whole different name that nobody can spell it's crazy uh go check that out www.indywrestling.network for your free seven day trial to get started so my guest this week again this is somebody that uh has been on the get list for a while and we finally lined it up and here he is in studio the juggernaut john Roden is with us here tonight welcome Welcome. Thank you. Thank finally, you for having me, man. It's finally. Finally. Like eight years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Off and on, asking to come on and just never lining it up. So. Exactly. Uh, so first of all, we do like to have a little bit of an icebreaker here on the show. So um, i like to ask, uh, what was your uh, earliest memory of pro wrestling? My earliest one, I can't tell you the event. I can't tell you what year. I'm going to guess it was like 98. It was uh, Jeff Jarrett slamming a guitar off of Xbox head, and that's what I remember first. And then, of course, like Mick Foley getting thrown off the Hell in a Cell. Mm. Those are like the two earliest that I can recall that I remember seeing and just being blown away. So Awesome. And that yeah. was just kind of what, what, what hooked you on it at the time? Was that like kind of the first <laughs> things you saw or just kind of the most memorable? Yeah, I don't know if that's what hooked me or not. Like I had an, I had an older brother. He's five years older than me, so it might have been just a – fit in with him and you know because it's you know you want to impress them and stuff but like it the bug just bit me hard like mm -hmm. for the first couple of years like 98 to like 2001 completely obsessed took over my life and then uh like from like 2001 to like 2003 is the years that i have no recollection of pro wrestling like i just stopped and like those are some of the best wait years, wait, like, wait wait now, now which years of your life were these what do you mean? How, well, old, how old were you at this point? 98, I was, well, I was born in 92, so 98, I was six. Yeah. So six, seven, eight, nine. Like, yeah, six to 10, I was into it deep, and then I took a break till I was like 12. Well, yeah, probably This 12. is This is something, I, I have this, and we, we just did another interview that was talking about like a, a, a period in like high school where they they got out of it. Like, I think everybody has this like fallout period for a couple of years, like the longtime fans. Mine was before high school, like, but... So it wasn't girls in sports that did it necessarily. No, not at all. <laughs> like, no, there's no girls. But I think, I don't even want to say it, but I think my brother just told me, he's like, you know, it's fake, right? You know, that stuff's fake. I was like, oh my gosh. So it, it like broke my heart. And I was like, well, I, you know, if they're lying to me, I can't, I can't watch it. So oh. like for a couple of years, I don't know. Like, So it was the realization. I guess. I don't know. Like Santa being revealed to you and all that. So I just like... <laughs> I, I don't know. My memory's horrible, but I just remember I remember him telling me that and it like traumatized me. <laughs> and then when I was twelve years old and I we moved up to a different area, I got the bug like real bad and then it just took off from there. I wanna point out this is also you're talking about the area where there there are where there was like Undertaker and Kane throwing lightning at each other, right? <laughs> what the year, like 98 and all yeah, that yeah yeah so yeah so but of course like that's not as outside the imagination when you're like 
six, seven yeah, years old. Yeah, you don't old. care. Yeah, you're, yeah. Into it. you're into the characters. It doesn't matter. This is on TV. It's in front of an audience. How can they fake this stuff? Yeah, right? and I mean, I, I don't care now. So. <laughs> yeah, <it's true. laughs> They're lightning now. Cool yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it, it, you know, hey, when you have 300 people, I just don't mind anymore. Yeah, if we could throw lightning in RWA, I'd, I'd pitch it. <laughs> I don't want to burn just the... Just one time. I was, I was worried when there was fire the one time. <laughs> Who had fire? Uh, I think Sean Phoenix was okay, there yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I would, I'm would. i just like, ooh, this place, I, it seems very flammable. Uh, so anyways, so you're with it for a while. Um, how did you go from uh, being a fan, returning to a fan, and then like, you know, deciding, you know, hey, I want to get into this and, and get in the ring and do this? Did, were you well, always kind of in that mindset, I want to get in the ring? Or, or when did that kind of come, when come I was, about? When I was 12 and we finally moved, we moved up to the country, and like the bug bit me hard. And mm. it, I remember bringing up this guy a lot. But Bronco McBride, I met him when I was 12 years old. We're sitting at the high school cafeteria table, and I'm the new kid, and I'm just sitting there looking around, not saying much, and, uh, you know, I don't know anybody. And I just randomly, I don't know why I asked, because I must have been obsessed, but I go, does anybody like wrestling? And I'll tell you the story. He goes, I like wrestling. And then it all just started from there, like... Oh my gosh! I'm like, just imagining in my head, uh, baby Rodin and baby Bronco, just like at the table. Yeah, and I, seeing him getting excited. I like wrestling. Yeah, I mean, I was a little chubbier, but we look exactly the same. So. <laughs> but yeah, it started from there. Like, I cannot tell you how obsessed I was with mm-hmm. professional wrestling for from like 12 to 17. That was that was it. Uh, me and McBride, we did a backyard promotion, like. <laughs> McBride would miss school so he could edit videos and he'd, he'd come in and he'd send me these, like we'd pass notes and he'd be like, Oh, look at this championship. And he'd draw it out and we had names, everything. So it was very, very deep. Like I can't explain it. All DVDs had to have them. I'd beg for pay-per-views. Like I just need this like one time. I promise I'll be good for the next couple months. You know, like I won't do anything. And then the worst paper you ever got was December to December. Oh, ECW. Yeah. Man. I was like, we got to get it. it it's going to be crazy. Extreme elimination chamber. And it was the worst garbage I've ever watched. <laughs> but, yeah. That, yep. that shattered a lot of dreams that night. <laughs> yeah. It started then like, yeah, 12 years old with McBride. It just never, never ended. Um, so, so, so how did you like finally, um, you know, of course doing the backyard thing for a while, yeah. but how did you like finally say, Hey, we're going to go get trained, do this. Well, McBride and my plan was to go to Georgia for WW4A, I believe it is the Mr. Hughes camp or his school Mr. down there Hughes. where like AR Fox went and stuff like that. Wow. So we we're going to move to Georgia right after we graduated from high school. Oh, we'll get a place and we'll, you know, we'll train all day and you know. That was the plan. Georgia, is this like around Atlanta or? I I don't know. I believe so. It, it probably is. There. But yeah, McBride went there once when he went down there. But that was the plan. Like, we are doing this no matter what. We have to do this. And we did the backyard stuff. And it started because we were sending, we were like linking backyard videos to like, uh, chuck roberts and and all that like iwc's page and oh like, no yeah oh no. yeah it's cringeworthy or at I'm least probably... i was i'm not gonna throw mcbride out there but i believe i was i was like can you watch this and let me know what you think and like we really thought we were good and uh it might have been flex or he's brought it up a few times and it's like go get trained go you know and we found iwc and it just made sense you know this is only an hour and a half away maybe two hours but Came to the realization we don't need to go that far. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't Georgia. <laughs> no, Georgia wasn't the answer when you're a 17 year old kid. Like, yeah, it wasn't probably the wisest move. But so you came in under, I believe you were Shima or DJ Z's. I don't know where he was at in the name change at the point. Uh, but you were DJ Z's uh, trainees at the time, right? Mm-hmm. For the most part. So yeah. how was that transition into it? Of course, you know, maybe doing a little bit with the backyard. I always hear you have to kind of unlearn all those bad habits when you go in. Eh, I think actually doing the backyard stuff, like I don't advise it at all, but no, like go, go get trained guys. The just, level of just, obsession we had, like we knew kind of knew what we were doing, like the roles and stuff like that. So I think it came easy to us. Mm-hmm. We were, as far as I know, DJ Z's only trainees. He told us plenty of times, like, I'm not training anybody else. You guys are it. Like we had four in the class and the two dropped out. So it was me and my best friend, like going through it. So, um, he was a good trainer. He had a lot of knowledge. This was right before he got into impact. Mm-hmm. Like he started blowing up. So we learned a lot, but, uh, he'd be the first one to tell you he wasn't the most reliable. Like he was very knowledgeable, but he wasn't the most reliable. There was plenty of times where me and McBride would 
drive an hour and a half to my mom's. She let us get the car because, you know, we don't want to damage other people's cars. We drive her car <laughs> to the training facility, and then we'd wait there for like three hours because he was incapacitated or something along those lines. Like, he was having fun, so... Mm-hmm. We weren't his primary focus, but when he did teach us, like we were learning amazing things. Like he brought in low rider, and like we were doing all sorts of lucha stuff. That's why you see McBride doing backflips, and mm-hmm. you know I'm pretty agile. I can do stuff like that because he said, "No, you're doing it." Like if I'm training you, you're gonna do it. It, it was interesting, and, and I've talked about multiple times on the show over the years about like yeah, these guys came out. They're blue collar sc- slaughterhouse, and it was like it's a it's a it's a redneck tag team that doesn't look like they should be doing the moon salts they are yeah you know like it was just like djz trainees obviously yeah we were the we were definitely we're the forgotten class from <laughs> iwc we, you didn't get approving grounds yeah we didn't i don't know it and like i said we can go deep into that if you want but like we had an opportunity to be the next tag team like the gambinos to come out and do something with it mm-hmm. and it wasn't because we didn't care like i cared about getting better and stuff like that but i wasn't listening to the advice that i was getting get Mm -hmm. in shape go to the gym start training more do do what you can on the side like i wasn't doing that and and that's my fault like for the longest time i held it against everybody else yeah you know in the dark ages like when i was you know depressed and stuff like that i'd be like why aren't we getting chances why aren't we getting well we did have chances and i wasn't utilizing that to the fullest like i was too young and immature at the time so talk about this. So you're a blue color solar house. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say, this is one of those things where, you know, you you guys were doing great things. I was, uh, it was a lot of fun to watch your matches, yeah. um, in that era. And, and then like, I just noticed like Broncos teammate kind of went away. Yeah. Uh, and everything too. Yeah. So, so, um, so what happened there? I don't know. I just let the wrestling business like discourage me a lot. There mm-hmm. was, I remember it was a, it was, it might've been a proving ground or something along that. It was, in that building that they had it in the white oak Mm -hmm. athletic we had a tag team match i had my girlfriend at the time and her friend come down so it was like two hours you know an hour and a half two hours and we get there and like our opponent one of the guys couldn't make it and i was like oh man this stinks like blah blah blah. so chuck i don't i mean it is what it is but he made mcbride team with the or he was going to face the other guy so i was out of the match i was going to stand at ringside and I was like, oh, my God. I said, I had family. Like, I, I confronted him about it. I said, I got family here, man. Like, they, they drove really far. He's like, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have to tell you. So I'd let something like that ruin, you know what I mean? Like, I'd carry mm-hmm. that. And I, I, I don't know. I held on to it for a while. And, like, I'm like, why are we getting opportunities and blah, blah, blah. Well, it was my fault, you know? If mm-hmm. I would have worked harder, if I would have been a standout guy, if, you know, there's other ways around it. But, um, yeah, it just started – it was a lot of the mental stuff with me. Like McBride was always be, they pick me up. Like, come on, dude, stick with it. Let's go. Let's do this. Like, we'd have cars break down. McBride's lost jobs because of pro wrestling. Like, no, I got to go train, or we had to go set up and tear down. Like, he's like, I just can't make it. I'm not going to be there. So he'd lose jobs. Like, he he was holding me together for a while there, and then it I like I quit for like a couple months, and then I'd come back, and then I'd quit again, and like I was pretty notorious. Like, you know, like I'd get in and out of it. it like I said, it was all my fault. But mm-hmm. so, so you disappeared for a while. Yeah, out of pro wrestling, you had to deal with your your stuff, right? Yeah, it um, was here and there. Like mm-hmm. I said, I take, I'd be like, oh, I quit, and I wait like two, three months, and then I go and do another show. <laughs> so it was I, kind of like a spotty thing in maybe yeah, places I was I haven't not heard dedicated of. at all. No, like, yeah, I yeah. loved it, and I like, but like I said, I was spiteful. Like I blamed everybody else. Like, like uh, I feel like. A lot of the trainers were like giving guys opportunities. Hey, come with me to the show. Come with me. But DJ Z was blowing up. He was going everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it's like we didn't have the guidance to push us. And it's not like I was asking. You, you, you didn't have help. your guy there yeah. anymore to help you out. Yeah, my trainer yeah. like took off. And that's no discredit to the other guys. Like, they're no, no, great. No. They're amazing. And I've learned so much from them, like Marshall and Hentai. Like, I look up to them so much. And, uh, but like, I, I just use that. Anything, anything for an excuse. I was, yeah. I was doing it at the time. Like, I could have bugged DJ Z, like, uh, you know. I could have said, hey, can you bring me here? And he took us to a couple shows here and there, like Tennessee and Chicago. But like I said, it's all about your drive and determination. I could have bugged him like crazy for these opportunities, and I didn't. So, so what was it that kind of clicked for you? Well, you know, obviously, it, there was a bit of a comeback. Yeah. And I remember you – I can't remember which show I saw you pop up in again. Probably and me and in Clearfield. Pro- probably. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, interesting how that all comes together. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> so, was, that was a moment. So, um, so, so, what, what kind of clicked? And 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 tell me about this journey to kind of 
become John Roden because you were a different name at the time, mm-hmm. um, and now you're a different person, a different character. Yeah, I'm a uh, doing something. Person, yeah. So. Um, uh, like I said, uh, I think that's why I click with my fans a lot. Like I've been through the depression and I've been through like self doubt, and mm-hmm. I there's nobody that's beating themselves up more than me. So I get that, and that's where I was in life. Uh, it was just constant, and uh, I think 2015, I got my job at a prison. And uh, that seems very common around wrestlers doing well these days. Yeah, I've well, just noted just just the anecdotally. <laughs> yeah, so I get a job at a prison, and this was January of 2015. And the reason I started to lose the weight was because I'm around the most dangerous people in the world. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? I was like, I want to be the baddest looking dude in here. Like, that was my mindset. Obviously, I'm not the baddest looking dude, but that was my mentality. Like, if I'm going to go in here, I'm going to give them a reason to hesitate when trying to mess with me. So it started from there, and, like, that first year of working at the jail, like, I'm not afraid to admit it. Like, I'm fine now, but the first year, I was miserable, like, mm-hmm. like clinically depressed. Like, couldn't stand it. Didn't know what I was doing with my life. So confused. I'd, like I said, I've like, nights, you're almost tearing up, you know? I'm like, mm-hmm. what am I doing with my life? Like, and uh, it just clicked. I, I want to say it was 2016 when I finally got it you know like i was seeing i'm trying to format the story here i'd see guys like palace get opportunities and Britt baker Mm -hmm. and stuff like that and i'm not gonna lie like i am happy for them i'm happy for any guy that's like working hard and gets an opportunity but in that state of mind when i was depressed i saw them get opportunity i said why them why Mm -hmm. are they getting a chance Mm -hmm. why are they going with that guy we were in iwc first we trained you know we were just as hard just as dedicated we drove farther than anybody you know, I lost cars. I've, I've spent money that I didn't have. McBride's lost jobs. Like, I was like, I'm sacrificing more than anybody. Why didn't I get it? And I was mad at them. I was happy, but I was mad. And then it just like, I'm the problem. I eventually, you know, like, that's what you got to realize. Everything that I got, I deserved mm-hmm. in pro wrestling for my first six years. It was my fault. So when you take accountability for that, that's when everything changed. And it was like in the middle of 2016. I don't know if it was somebody getting an opportunity or a match on Raw or something like that, but a light bulb switched, and I just stepped it into a new gear, and I was like, I'm going to become the best indie wrestler that I can, you know, and, and like, that's my goal even to this day. I want to be the best in the area. Like, I don't know if I'm there. I feel like I'm climbing the ranks slowly. Like, when I'm on shows, I feel like I'm starting to creep up onto people's radar, but that was the driving force. Like, middle of 2016, super depressed. I was mm-hmm. like, screw this. It's my turn to get an opportunity, and it snowballed from there. So you got so so again. First time I saw you back was uh, Clearfield, and somewhere like, around there. Who's somewhere this John? Twenty sixteen. Yeah, a little bit like who's this John Roden guy? And I'm like, he looks a little familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, and, and with Noctis, who uh, you know, kind of funny because he, again, he was just in there in here for an interview, and you guys are involved in some stuff in RWA as well. Yeah. So, full, again, kind of another so, full yeah. circle happening. I was kind of like my coming out party there for, mm-hmm. you know, re, re-emergence. And, I, like, IWC, I wanted to prove something. And I'm way better than I was then. But, like, that was like, holy crap, he lost the weight. He, he actually did what he said he was going to do. Yeah. And I think I thought the match was decent. So, I don't know. It was, like I said, my goal is to kind of make up for the lost time that I spent the last six years before that that I didn't take advantage of every opportunity. It's like, now if you give me one, I'm going to do everything I can to, you know, put your faith in me and be that guy. So that's been my mission. So what what was, um, you were, uh, you know, kind of part of a team, blue, sl- blue collar slaughterhouse, mm-hmm. and now you kind of become this uh, juggernaut character. Can you talk yeah. about a little bit of the mindset that's, that's kind of applied to uh, how you're presenting yourself these days? Yeah, uh, I, don't, I can't tell you where the juggernaut name where I just picked up the juggernaut, but the Rodin, you know, uh, Augustus Rodin, something like that. He did the thinking man. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was, I kind of got it from that. I was wondering in my head, I, I, I think I miss, I misplace it for Ronin. Yeah. You know, like, uh, which is, I think, uh, former samurai. I got Rodin. I get, yeah, I've gotten my name messed up. It doesn't matter what it is. It's going to mess up. Like, I was <laughs> well, it's ma- going to be because, I mean, we just, you know, the most reliable of announcers are in indie wrestling. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, announcers. I just, there's been some rough ones. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it was just the thinking aspect. Uh, 
the thinking man. And like, I cannot tell you how many nights I spent obsessing about pro wrestling and dissecting it and thinking about my goals and how to beat this depression and how to get out of it. Like, and I was like, okay, that's fitting. I like the name Rodin. It's the thinker, you know, it just tied in together. So with the juggernaut, I kind of apply it to like, if you see any of my posts online, it's all about positivity. It's all about going for it. It's all about stepping out of your comfort zone. So mm-hmm. straightforward, you know, I'm going to bother you as much as possible and I'm going to keep showing up until you give me the chance. Like I, I got a wheelhouse of companies. Hey, do you have an opportunity? I can come in. Hey, do you have an opportunity? I can come in. Justin Plummer. Hey, I see you're going to be in Clearfield. Can I show up? Blah, blah, blah. It's just mm-hmm. constant. Like I will not stop. I will have you stop talking to me because I bother you before I don't ask. You know what I mean? So a complete 180 from what you were doing before. Yeah. And that's what I realized. Mm-hmm. I wasn't asking. I wasn't asking for advice. I wasn't asking to work top guys. I was just settling with whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Now my mindset is I want the best that Pittsburgh has. And I, obviously I go all over now. Like I'm starting to branch out, but like I want Pittsburgh. Like this is my area. This is where I started. It's my turn. So like I said, in like a couple posts ago, I want Wardlow. I want Palace. I want LaRusso. Whoever they think the best is, that's who I want to be against. I want Hentai and all that. Like, it's just, I don't know. Like I said, you, you've been about every promotion from Rise to Black Diamond, even just this past weekend, yeah. uh, RWA, IWC, and, uh, and all around, uh, uh, you know, the outside of the state as well. Yeah. Um, mostly I'm seeing you at RWA. You got yeah. a lot going on there. It mm-hmm. seems like you had about 10 matches with Bronco. Uh, <laughs> 10,000. <000. laughs> yeah, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but still, oh, no matter how repetitive like that you were having another match was, mm-hmm. It still was an amazing match, and something different happened. Thank and you, yeah. that is impressive yeah. uh, for that going from month to month because um, it was definitely one of those. And I don't know what was going on with the booking at the time and stuff, but yeah. you know, it was a lot of the you know kind of like how many times we're we going to see Seth and Dolph Ziggler, uh, yeah. you know, every Monday night. Um, but it was something different. You guys had a lot of story and a lot of back to back and forth, yeah. and it's interesting because now it again talking full circle you've kind of come back together into a tag team this past month too. Can yeah. you talk about a little bit of like uh, uh, coming to RWA, that vibe and that path for you? Yeah. Um, if I had to thank anybody as part of my big resurgence, it's Dr. Feelbad. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care what anybody says about him. He gave me a chance when nobody was. Like when I did this whole resurgence thing, he said, come in here, do what you got to do, like impress me. And I, I think it was like the second show I did for him. He, he pulled me to the side. He said, and it like, got to me he's like man you did so well i don't know what they what the other companies were doing like i can't believe they let you go and he's like you have a home here and you can do it and like it was that word of encouragement like the pat on the back i'm like okay yeah i'm doing something here and it just snowballed from there and then i had that feud with mcbride and it's still kind of a feud right now but like you said i pride myself in those series of matches that we had because i felt like Every time I was like, oh, we got to do this again, and we're going to go to war again, and I feel like we kept stepping it up, or we added a new layer to the story, or there was some kind of twist. Like, you face a guy month after month after month, and even the other guys in the back are like, oh, you guys again, blah, blah, blah. But I felt like we were delivering, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? I felt like we were the hottest feud at the time. So, and then it comes full circle. Now we're a tag team again. So I feel like I got to prove it on my own by myself. Now it's like, okay, well, step into the tag team realm and do it again. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Cause I, I couldn't be that partner that I was in 2011 when I first started, like I wasn't dedicated. I, I was the quitter. I, you know, I had to be talked into doing stuff. So now it's kind of like a redemption thing. Obviously we're butting heads as you can see, and we're always going to butt heads. I've butted heads with him for 14 years. <laughs> this is so what we're seeing in the ring is not too much different than what we happens in real life. Not at all. He's, yeah. he's the friend, uh, and the enemy, I don't, I, like we will butt heads, and I will say what he doesn't want to hear, and if I say something he doesn't like, he's gonna fire right back, and that's mm-hmm. like what you see in the ring is real. Like when it comes to wrestling, we will bicker, we will fight, we will, you know, die on our sword for what we believe, and and that's what you're gonna get with a tag team now. So it's it's exciting and it's stressful. Like you got two kind of alpha mentalities clashing now, and plus we had so many good matches with each other so it's an interesting dynamic like rwa is going to get crazy with the tag team division <laughs> that's great yeah um so like i say it's been it's been a, a really amazing story and, and great to kind of watch 
and I say I've been behind the camera and behind the edit on on a lot of these uh, from from the beginning mm. uh, of of your career. And it's cool to see you back in the scene here again. Yeah. Um, so what are you watching these days? Um, whether it be a promotion or any individuals out there that kind of got your attention, whether it's just you know stuff that's inspiring you or just stuff that that you know to watch out for as you're traveling around. Um, stuff that inspires me is kind of like these guys that are starting to break out. Like I, I went to the Harley camps, you know, in 2016 and 2017 for like a week, week straight. And what are the, the, the Harley camps? Yeah. Harley race pro wrestling camps. Okay. He, he has them for like a week long. You pay X amount of dollars. You go all the way to Missouri and you, you stay the week and you train mm-hmm. with, uh, he had Steve Carino. He had, wow. he had the guys from new Japan. I trained under delirious, uh, Dave Taylor, you know, William Regal's old partner. Like, I trained with some of the best professional wrestlers in the world. And my first camp was, uh, I wasn't ready. Like, I was in the process of losing weight and getting my stuff together. But I felt like I was in the top 10. Like, you, you can take a visual, like, okay, I, I'm hanging in there with these guys. And then uh, I went back in 2017. And uh, my mindset was completely different. I said, I'm going to crush this camp. Like, I'm going to be the top guy. I'm going to stand out and, uh, it, it just ties into sacrifice. Like I'm, I'll bring it up. I was in a nine year relationship, you know, through all that depression, through all the wrestling nine year relationship, something didn't feel right. And I felt like I had to go after wrestling with everything I got. Like, this is what I need to do. And it wasn't clicking. So a girl I loved and I still cared about, I said, I got like, I cut it off and I, and I went to the camp like a week later and I said, I'm going to kill this camp. Like I've got nothing to lose. Like I don't have a house. Like I'm gone. Like, you know, I'm going to do everything I can. So they're lining us up and we're about to do a drill and they say, go ahead and say your name and, uh, do the role so we can, you know, we realize your name and guys are going up and they're standing there. Uh, Jeffrey Smith, do a forward roll. Uh, John Cena, do a forward roll. So I get up there. I scream at the top of my lungs, John Roden, sir front roll go back through again and then they're like all right do a back roll i'm like i'm john roden (laughs) do a back roll again i was like i'm just gonna stand out i'm gonna be outrageous so i said are you allowed to swear yeah go for it well it's just i go up the one time and uh i said who wants to see a big ass roll and the crowd goes yeah everybody's like yeah so i do the roll and i like i was just doing everything possible to stand out and have you heard of brody king yes Okay, from PWG and all that, like he's mm-hmm. branching out. Mm-hmm. The first camp, there was a couple guys that uh, got opportunities from that. Like they were, I started seeing them popping up all over the place. So, 2017, I see Brody King, and I'm, and you gauge the room. I said, this is this is the guy they're looking at. Like he's got a look. He's huge. He's covered in tats. Like I was like, okay, it's gonna be me and him. So they're doing a drill. Let's do A, B, and C. He's like, I don't care what you do, but get A, B, and C into this drill. I said, okay. So we didn't talk. We we're just looking at each other. I, I see him jump up. I jump up. I get in the ring with him. And uh, out of nowhere, I just go face to face with him. Bam! Right across his face as hard as I could. I said, everybody thinks you're the top guy here. I'm the top guy. I'm taking over this camp, and I'm getting all eyes on me. Like, I was just cutting a promo in his face. And, like, as soon as I smacked him, the whole room, oh, I was like, okay, I got it. And obviously we clobbered the crap out of each other and it was, Mm -hmm. it was amazing. But, and what does, what does A, B and C mean? Like, let's say the guy goes, I want to see you hit a clothesline and one of you try and get an arm drag in there and the other guy try and do this. Okay. So it was, so just kind of hitting the, like the three standard. Yeah. You can do whatever you want, but I want to see you try and get this in. Yeah. Okay. So like I said, without telling him, wham, smack the taste right out of his mouth. And I was like, I don't know. We became friends after that, but I was like, he's the top guy. Like I'm going to make an impression like, and, uh, and that's one of those things at the end of the camp, we had a match. Do you remember the ax men that came into RWA? Yes. Those giant guys. Yes. I wish they'd come back. I've yeah, been following them ever they're since. They're huge. Oh they're amazing. They like beat- usually, um, the ax men are like just giant lumberjacks. Like they probably, they're probably about my height. It's about six, four ish. Right. Yeah. But, they're like, huge. Real thick. Yeah. Uh, and just looked like two, just, yeah, they're and beef, they just, yeah. just, I think they destroyed an entire battle royal or something, yeah, right? Yeah, I was in there. They you, destroyed you, you, me. Yeah, they, <laughs> you're one they of them. They me. I was, yeah. Uh, but, but again, like, you're like, oh, it's going to be like big guy clobber match. But it was like, it was real impressive. Those guys were yeah, really good. Yeah, and the crowd loved them. Mm-hmm. Like, it was their first night. And like I said, I told them, I said, this crowd's crazy. They're going to love you. Like, 
Mm-hmm. You guys got a character, and you're big, and you hit hard. And mm-hmm. So the last day of the camp, they're setting up matches. All right, we're going to have this and this and that. And then the last match, they were setting up me and Brody King versus the Axemen. I was like, okay, let's have the best match we can. So we go out there, and we, we have a, a pretty good match. And uh, like I said, we killed it. I, I feel like we did. It just made sense, and it was like you know highs and lows, and it was mm-hmm. all this drama. We finished the match, and Steve Carino looks at us, and he says, guys – Said, I don't got a complaint. And he's an NXT coach. He's like an assistant yeah, coach. Yeah. Guys, I ain't got nothing bad to say about that. He said, I wouldn't be afraid to put that on NXT TV. So inside, I'm like, oh my gosh. I was like, wow, this is the greatest moment of my life. You know, like all little <laughs> things like that. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, I was so proud. So Brody King, PWG, all over the country, going everywhere, Axemen, all over the country, flying everywhere, stuff like that. And then there's me. So I'm like, I was kind of like another kick, you know, I was like, okay, like I'm knocking on the door. It's going to be my time. Like I was a part of that. I was a part of that camp. But now it's kind of like, instead of saying, damn, that should be me. Yeah. You're looking at, I'm so close. You're like, I'm so close. I'm yeah. missing just one thing. Right. Yeah. I was, yeah. I was like, I was hanging with those guys mm-hmm. that, and that was my mindset. Like I'm in there, I'm in the top four, like, you know, coming out of that. I said, I'm missing something, but if I stick with this long enough, it's going to show up. Like, I'm going to figure out what it is. It's so, awesome. yeah, we're still doing it, but yeah, it's it. They didn't have a camp this year, but if they did, I would have been there. It's just, you got to show up. Yeah. And that's what I try and tell guys. Like, I offer rides in cars. I, I do all that. Like, I'll give any advice I can, but you have to show up. If you don't show up, nobody's going to see you. Nobody's going to come asking for you. You know what I mean? You have to be there. And, then, and that's the biz- biggest advice I can give to guys now. Just and, be there. And that's everything. It's everything from familiarity to just being there when an opportunity comes up, yeah. right? Somebody like, cancels, you're there, mm-hmm. you grab your stuff. It can I, be anything. I, I've been shocked like multiple times how many people, how many times I would see people um, backstage at another promotion, mm-hmm. you know, and then realize like two, three months later, and I see them on the card. Yeah. And you never know what's going to happen from there. Yeah. That's what you got to do. Like I said, they. I went to Evolve seminar, which I'm going to tomorrow. But it was with William Regal and Gabe Sapolsky said, Darby Allen, have you ever heard of him? Uh, he said Darby Allen would drive hours upon hours just to set up the ring. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't get an opportunity. Boop, go back, mm-hmm. set up again, set up again. And then eventually his spot opened up and bam, now he's like one of their top guys in that company. So you got to have that tenacity. You got to be bugging people. You got to be a constant reminder in their ear. And that's what I try to do. So I um I usually ask at this point what's the best and worst about pro wrestling, but I think mm-hmm. you've really kind of covered them already <laughs> <laughs> in oh, your I experiences. Mean, yeah. So uh, yeah, I've been through the best. I've been through the highs and the lows. Mm-hmm. So like I get it when people get discouraged and mm-hmm. like in my personal life too. Like so many fans have opened up to me. Like I'm not gonna put all their business out there, but like so many fans have come to me. Your mm-hmm. stories inspired me. What you've done has motivated me to do this A, B, and C. And it's like I said, it's uh. Same thing with wrestling. Like, recently, Black Diamond. Hey, man, I love what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm not going to name drop again. I love what you're doing. Every time I see your post, it gets me pumped up. It gets me motivated. Mm -hmm. But I can't stand you for posting that. Like, I can't (laughs) stand to see you doing so good. I'm like, all right, I'm on to something. Like, that could be anybody. You just... I'm no different from anybody else. It's a good story. It's a good story. It's a good background. It gets people behind you. Do you have any... um, There's been a lot of it throughout, but is there any a big... Nugget of advice, uh, not maybe even for people in wrestling, but people that are dealing with uh, being in a dark place in their life, like like you found your, yourself at one point. Yeah. Um, like I said, I, I try to be there for anybody. Like if a fan messages me, if it's serious, I'll get back to you. Like, you know, even not serious. I talk to so many people and I don't mind helping and I don't have all the answers, but like. I read books, I watch video, I obsess about positivity, and you just got to bring that into your life. If you're wa- if you're watching negative posts, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to bring mm-hmm. you down. If you if you're trying if you're calling yourself a piece of crap, then you're going to feel like it. You know, um, I, re- I heard a quote the other day: "Comparison is the thief of joy," and that was the biggest thing, and that hit me. Like I was like, oh, man, because yeah. guess what I was doing? Comparing myself to Palace, comparing myself to Wardlow, comparing myself to. Uh, name a top guy on the scene like why are they getting that why ain't i you don't need to compare you need to do what you can do why ain't i like brody king like that's another example Mm -hmm. like don't compare yourself you're there's only one you and 
you know i and think that's people's biggest problems i'm not i'm not like that person well he has a he has all this stuff well that ain't you man that ain't your story mm -hmm. like i i got so many i got bad luck i got this and that draw a new hand like i used to work with kids that got arrested and they were on their last strike before they go to jail you know juvenile offenders well i just got dealt a bad hand draw a new hand mm -hmm. the deck's right there taking our shot nobody ever said you couldn't draw another hand so I don't care what disadvantage you have. I've heard every story, you know, and I, I sympathize with you. I know that's horrible. Like, I understand because I've been horrible. And that's why I have no problem helping people. Like, I know what it's like to feel like you're not enough with wrestling, with your personal life, with everything. So, like, that's my best advice for you. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Be the best you you can. Wake up every day and try and do something to better yourself. If you have a thought... Maybe I should message Sorg and see if I can get on the show. Boom. Message him right now. Don't Look at us two weeks it. later. Here we are. Yeah. It was instant. Like I mm -hmm. said, I'm sitting there at home and I'm like, what, what am I doing? What could I be doing right now? Okay. I could be messaging this company. Boop, 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 boop. Done. I could be doing this. I should, it's a I should lot make a easier today to do that kind of stuff. Trust me. Yeah. It's a lot easier. Like you said, and like ask for advice, ask for help. Um, yeah, ask for help. Never think you're alone. That's the biggest advice, too. Don't think you're alone. Everybody's mm -hmm. got problems. I've I've heard horrible stories, and people have been through so much, and I would have never guessed it. You know, people are good at hiding stuff, mm -hmm. hiding pain. So talk about it. There's no shame in talking about it. We all go through it. Awesome. I'll listen. People will listen. Where can people find your positive posts online? John Roden on Facebook. That's the biggest thing. And then uh, Instagram, Juggernaut Roden. I think it's Juggernaut underscore Roden. But yeah, I mean, follow me, like my stuff. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Like, we'll talk. I'll talk to anybody. It's all about positivity. And I feel like I'm finally gaining momentum, you know, as far as people supporting me and stuff like that. So, and I say a lot of before and after pictures yeah. about the transformation. Yeah. Uh, to see, you know, exactly what all has gone, like how much of a transformation it was for them. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you, it wasn't perfect. Like, there's, mm. I'm still not perfect. I still struggle to lose weight. I still struggle with, self-doubt like you're gonna have that but you don't stay like that that's the biggest thing i can say don't fall into a rut mm -hmm. if you're upset be upset for the night i tell people that too this happened this happened we'll be upset take an hour to be upset and cry and, and feel horrible and then done there's no reason to stick with it so. absolutely yeah. well thank you so much again if you guys want to check out uh look up some old blue collar slaughterhouse don't look up John old blue collar yeah, no, no, just you know for for research purposes. If you want to have a good laugh, look up <laughs> Blue Collar Slaughterhouse. Go you know, go find one of those old IWC shows, Blue Collar Slaughterhouse. Then go go <laughs> check out the RWA's Bloody Harvest um, on VOD. Uh, it's, it, it starts at only three ninety nine, And uh, you can see like that transformation of the tag team. Yeah. Really? I mean, that, that's an A-B comparison right there. Yeah. Watch oh. 30 seconds of Blue Collar Slaughterhouse. <laughs> yes. Then switch to John Road and stuff. <laughs> exactly. It's okay. Advice. Those old shows are cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. It's a great story, and I hope uh, I, I thank you for coming on and, and, and sharing it with everybody here. I think it's really important for uh, some people to hear something like this happening. No doubt. Thank you so much. Like I said, I waited eight years to get on the show. We went from <laughs> I was pulling cord for you at IWC. Now we're oh, having an yeah. interview. Like, yeah, and like I remember the cord get snagged, and he'd be like, "What are you doing? Come on!" Like I'm like, "Oh no!" At least you're not the you're not the one I tripped over and said to get out. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know. I don't think he came back. So. Okay. <laughs> That's a story for off air. But anyways, thank you so much, everybody. Check thank it out. Uh, support John Roden and, uh, above all today. And always, please, support Indie Wrestling. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.